welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, TuneIn, and Spotify by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the Virtual Memories Show on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. A happy end of summer. I am posting this as Labor Day weekend wraps up 2018 for all of you time travelers in the audience, and I'm gearing up for a kind of rough six weeks of work and travel in September and October. If all goes anything near according to plan, the podcast will be rolling just fine through December. Uh, And that's with a minimum of podcasts actually coming together at the Small Press Expo or Cartoon Crossroads Columbus this month. I cannot believe I just mentioned December during Labor Day weekend, but eh, that's where we are. Anyway, let's dive into this week's episode. Now, my guest is the author Glenn David Gold, who has a new memoir out called I Will Be Complete from Knopf. It is a phenomenal book. Uh, Jeez, it's going to sound dumb. Anything I try and describe it as is going to be is going to come up short. So um, it captures Glenn's exceedingly odd childhood and youth and, and carries through grad school and towards him becoming the guy who would one day write one of my all-time favorite novels, Carter Beats the Devil. Um, it doesn't actually take you to that point. Um, you don't see the seeds of that necessarily in the course of the memoir, but but that's who he turns into. Um, now, Glenn doesn't pull any punches about his own behavior in the book, um, especially some of his disastrous choices with relationships, but I Will Be Complete is as much about Glenn's mother as it is about him. And she makes some life choices that one, frankly, would not expect a mother to make. Um, he renders her as, as sympathetically as he can, given the the complexities and vagaries of their relationship um, and the, well, the fundamental betrayal of the parent-child connection. Um the first part of the book, uh, which is mainly about the story of his his early years, his parents' divorce, after which his mom moved them up to, to San Francisco um, from L.A. in the thrall of an absolutely amazing con man who's pseudonymously named Peter Charming for the sake of the book. Um, the first part is absolutely breathtaking. It is an amazing, amazing uh, piece of writing. What comes after is also really good. We talk about the sense of a letdown uh, in in parts two and three, just based on the the energy and vitality of some of the characters in part one during our conversation. But um, what's there, what this guy is, who he becomes through his school years, through college, grad school, etc., um, makes you want to give him a a alternately a hug and a, a slap. Um, the latter, I say, because 
some of his behavior is way too familiar to me um, based on the way I behaved at, at Glenn's age uh, in those college and grad school years. And I wish to God someone had been around to slap or shake some sense into me back then. Um, I Will Be Complete is fantastic. It is a rich, complicated book written by someone who really knows how to tell a story. And you can feel the process of him trying to figure out how to tell his story instead of the the two novels that he's written previously. Um, like I said, I'm coming up short on details about it. So let me read you the flat copy of the book because there's no way I can really do justice to the, the wildness of all this. Glenn David Gold was raised rich, briefly, in Southern California at the end of the go-go 1960s. But his father's fortune disappear, his parents divorce, and Glenn falls out of his well-curated life and into San Francisco at the epicenter of the me decade, the inimitable 70s. Gold grows up with his mother among con men and get-rich-quick schemes. Then, one afternoon when he's 12, she moves to New York without telling him, leaving him to fend for himself. I Will Be Complete is the story of how gold copes, honing a keen wit and learning to fill in the emotional gaps. Quote, I feel love, and then it's like I'm driving on black ice with no contact against the road. He leads us through his early salvation at boarding school, his dream job at an independent bookstore in L.A. in 1983, a punk rock riot, a romance with a femme fatale to the soundtrack of R.E.M., and his attempts to forge a career as a writer. Along the way, Gold becomes increasingly fascinated with with his father's self-described cheerful amorality and estranged from his mother, who lives with her soulmate, a man who threatens to kill her. Clear-eyed and heartbreaking, Gold's story ultimately speaks to everyone who has struggled with the complexity of parental bonds by searching for and finding autonomy. I will be complete. Fantastic memoir. Uh, it means I am two for two in great experiences, uh, great experiences with Glenn's books, which means I am embarrassed to admit I have not read Glenn's second novel, Sunnyside. I ordered a copy after we talked. Uh, I'm not sure why I never took the book up before. Um, it might be because I enjoyed Carter Beats the Devil so much that I was afraid I would read the follow up with a set of expectations that wouldn't be fair. It's happened before. It is something that I am pretty good at getting over nowadays. But um, anyway, that was back in 2009 or so when Sunnyside came out. I was a different man back then. So this episode was recorded when I was in L.A. for about 30 hours prior to a business conference in San Diego. About two weeks before the trip, I put out a call on Facebook for guest suggestions. I tried Twitter, too, but no one ever responds to that. Um and the, car, uh, the comic artist Howard Chaikin, who I recorded with last year during an L.A. trip um, and who I've stayed in touch with since, wrote me recommending Glenn. I told him how much I loved Carter Beats the Devil. And so he just introduced us, connected us, recommended me, and uh, here we are. Thanks, Howard. Um, there aren't a ton of caveats on this one. I had to take out some background noise um, from various uh, uh, the fridge that was operating in the background, a uh, little water uh, circulator for the cat, etc. Uh, there is a weird reverb that pops up occasionally. I couldn't get rid of that. Also, I said something mean about Frank Miller, um, but it was just to get a laugh from Glenn. Rest assured, I continue to dig aspects of Frank's work after high school. And I would love to record with him for episode number 300 of the show. Oh, also, I was exhausted because I took a very early flight to L.A., got a terrible night's sleep before that. Uh, there were some complications after arrival, so I was meh. Uh, also, I was tweaking on New Vigil during our conversation, which may or may not explain some things. Here's Glenn's bio. Glenn David Gold is the author of the best-selling novels Sunnyside and Carter Beats the Devil, which has been translated into 14 languages. His essays, memoir, journalism, and short fiction have appeared in McSweeney's, Playboy, Tin House, Wired, Ziziva, The New York Times Sunday Magazine, The Garden UK, and London Independent. He has written The Spirit for DC Comics and The Escapist for Dark Horse. His essays on the artist Jack Kirby accompany the landmark Masters of American Comics and Comic Book Apocalypse Museum shows. Recently, he has co-written episodes of The Thrilling Adventure Hour and Welcome to Night Vale. His new book is a three-part memoir, I Will Be Complete. 
And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Glenn David Gold. There are a lot of ways I've gotten over the imposter syndrome that really does characterize everything I do, which might be a good place for us to start. Imposter syndrome? Feeling it? Nope. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Therapy help with that, or did you always feel like you actually knew what you were doing? Hard to know because I've been in therapy since I was four and a half years old. I forgot. Old. Yes. Of so <laughs> it's hard to know what to credit with that. But no, I've uh, it's not been a thing for me. Mm -hmm. When did you feel that you were ready for memoir? I know you started this project in in one incarnation. Yeah, ready years for it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky concept. Yeah. Um, I had no respect for memoir in my 20s. I had this kind of Stal Stalinist attitude about how if you were going to make art, it had to be fiction. If it wasn't transformed by your imagination, then it wasn't really art. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about. But then again, we all what, had our bullshit. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I had nothing but that. I was <laughs> Which 27. Which you enumerated very, very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had I had some very strongly held opinions that were based on nothing uh, except egoism. Um, and, uh, you know, I, one of the issues for me was I thought uh, that if after being a fiction writer for a while, you write a memoir, it's sort of like saying here, are my, you know, you, you've liked my paintings in the museum. Now look at the brushes I use to paint them, yeah. you know? Um, but more than that, um, I couldn't find the right tone when I'd write about my own life. Uh, it came across as ridiculous, even if I was trying to be straight, sort of like when people write very straight novels about Hollywood, people always think they're satire. Well, Veep yeah. is a documentary. Right. That yeah. is my, my four years of, of lobbying and being down in Capitol Hill. Yeah. yeah. I, I, people, is it like House of Cards? Is it like this? Like, no. Yeah. It's like Veep. Yeah. It really is. That's my, that's the impression I got. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I, it just took, it took a while to, to, to get into that head to realize how to do it. Mm -hmm. And when did it, well, I mean, you talk about finding the tone. Was it an issue with that as opposed to finding a shape? Well, for what it all meant, or those. They all go, I mean, they'll go hand in hand. It's funny. I mean, yeah. you know the way that uh, finding a story works is that there's there's all kinds of different ways to to quantify or qualify how how it all comes together. Uh, and for me, it was finding the voice, and voice then implies character, which implies shape, which implies you know sure. if there's character, then you have conflict and you have resolution and you have a shape. So all that stuff needed to kind of come together at the same time. Yeah. And did you feel in your own life that you had had? resolution at that point yeah or sure was that yeah necessary well about what this, this yeah, yeah yeah what this was about yeah, yeah. I, when it, when i realized so when it, when i finished my last uh novel i knew i wanted to write something involving memoir and i had just like bullet points of what i thought were going to be i want to do this essay and this essay and this essay and then i started to think maybe i want to do a multi-volume memoir about my life but i didn't really know what the focus would be and so unfocused i thought it was gonna be seven volumes and then once I understood, so he's going to make a Bill Vollman joke or a Canals guard, but right, know, I know right? both of those guys. <laughs> yeah, both of those guys just swim in my wake, you know. Um, <laughs> but they, they meaning meaning Kanoff, uh, talked me into focusing it a little more strongly, and I realized that it was three volumes. Uh, you'd mentioned that the first draft was terrible. Yeah, what changed? You know, was it again that process of finding well, or putting yourself things, in? Well, a few things changed. I mean, the thing that I, I talk about a lot in interviews is the the process of putting myself in as a character. And all. But really what also changed, and I'd forgotten about this until recently, was that I tried to do it chronologically. And this, as, it se as the book appears, it seems chronological, but it's not. I withhold one key piece of information, which oh, yeah. is being in yeah, the cycle. Very, very well. Yeah. Yes. I withhold that until the very end of the book. I initially put that in the beginning because I thought, how can you possibly interpret all the rest of my life without knowing this weird thing that happened yeah. when I was a kid? But the effect on readers was it's sort of like introducing myself as a lab rat and then asking you to empathize with me. And for most people, the experience of saying, you know, yeah, you were in psychoanalysis for four years, just saying that, like yeah. people are immediately like take about four steps back. Right. And so I think that... What I had thought was an important filter for everyone to re read the book, I had just draft after draft thought, you have to know all this stuff at the beginning. Otherwise, the rest of the book doesn't make sense. I was completely wrong about it. Yeah. And in fact, the book only makes sense if you don't know that stuff. In that respect, how much did it reflect your, your novel experience in terms of the incredibly, incredibly well-constructed 
novel you did in Carter Beats the Devil, which I should say I was turned on to by a pal of mine who told me that he started it one night. Um, and the next thing he knew, his wife was asking him if he wanted orange juice for <laughs> breakfast that morning because <laughs> mm-hmm. he was still sitting at the desk reading and reading and reading. And, <laughs> it's nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. And that was essentially my experience. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was an overnight out to Ohio and I had yeah. the same, I could stop reading it or I could just keep going and, right. and be bleary at the, the conference tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I blame you. Thank but, you. Um, but how much in that sense did the, 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 the knowledge of the mechanics of fiction as, as you employed them previously? Yeah. Um, play into again figuring out that, that was the not Jenga, but that yeah. was the the thing that was going to make it. Oh, wait a second! Yeah, very much so. Um, first couple drafts, I I tried to keep out uh, all the fiction. I was just trying to do being a journalist, be the floating eye over everything, and that didn't work. Um, and then the story in the situation by Vivian Gornick, uh, which uh, my friend Rob Spillman pushed me in front of. Um, that made me understand that I was trying to do something subjective and build myself as a character. And at that point, I understood that I needed to be the filter through which all the information passed. And if that was true, then I was the protagonist of the book. If I was the protagonist of the book, what is the character conflict resolution? Because I'm a structure kind of guy. Yeah. And I, you know, I mess with it all the time, but it's important for me to have the structure down first before I start to take liberties. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carter is, you know, deeply structured book. Yeah. You know, whenever... I was trying to do something crazy with historical fiction or felt that I was going nuts with perspective or something. I'd always have like the structure to bounce off against pretty classical. So I had then with the memoir, three separate books, three separate stories, three separate structures um, that I could play around with as long as I was going to be the guiding force going through it. Mm -hmm. And the other four volumes and never going to see the light of day, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think that's just the magic of editing. <laughs> um, reception so far, or you, do you avoid? I know I was going to avoid reviews, but all of them have been fantastic. Okay. Um, I've gotten just shockingly good reviews. Um, here in England, I mean, no reservations at all. It seems, um, I, Oh, actually no, the Washington post busted me about structure, which, I would complain about if I understood the whole review. It was. Uh, I was glad because I noticed yeah. um, I'm friends with Michael Durda at the yeah. Washington Post, but yeah. it wasn't by him. No, it was, so uh, that's uh, William Gurdy. Gu- I can't remember. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. He's supposed to be. He's, 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 like a, he's a tough reviewer, but yeah. yeah. And so I, I, was, I was thankful because yeah. I know Michael yeah. likes Carter. So yeah. I, I thought, oh, maybe he's going to review. The Post has thing. been very nice to me. Also, yeah. um, they've let me review books for them and stuff. But anyway, that review, um, which was which was very largely positive, um, I, I would. Uh, uh, it seems trivial of me to complain about structure, but I was actually rather proud of the structure for it. And he, and, uh, he said something about the middle part of it being formless. I'm like, no, no, no. I was okay. But anyway, if, if, he, if he didn't feel it, he didn't feel it. Yeah. I, I think what it might be is simply projection over the feeling when the first section ends mm-hmm. and that very, very critical character in your, mm-hmm. your mom and your life. Um, goes to you know falls away from the stage yeah. uh, i think there might have that sense of letdown may mm-hmm. have just you know been too much of a depressing thing for the the, the critic that yeah oh, you know but, but peter's <laughs> not there you know he's, yeah. he's sort of the center yeah. um who was one of the more remarkable characters Peter Charming? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, yeah you you know i would say unfortunately um he seems as vivid as as Patrick Melrose's dad. Oh, uh, yeah, which, right. you know, yeah, not yeah. in the same you know abusive way, but just in that that vivacity. That well, a also the Melrose have. novels were very. I mean, they were very influential on me as well. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it was. I um, I've heard several interviews with him where he talked about how he felt if he told the story, he would die. And I started to think about how he had to create a fictional conceit in order to tell the story, and I understand that level of filter. And I thought, well, what if I create the same fictional conceit, but I don't change any facts. Mm-hmm. And if I don't make anything up, but to sort of keep the idea of these are characters. And I think that as a novelist, you get an idea of listening to a character and thinking, yeah, okay, this is something the characters do. This is this doesn't feel true to the character. I don't know what the character would do here. If you're based on a real person in life, a lot of those questions are answered already. And it's just about making that person like finding an avatar for them, finding their, like, you know, what their Simpsons persona would be, you know, <laughs> give them a little yellow skin and a couple of a fewer fingers. And what is it that they look like on the page? Hmm. Did you ever get better with relationships? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Um, just cause you know, I, there are many aspects of your book that resonated with me from oh, yeah. my, my, I'm about six or seven years younger than you, but, yeah. um, 
Yeah. Uh, How are the relationships going for you? Uh, that I'm, I'm perfectly stable with, but I had a, uh, in my case, it was art school girls of doom. Oh, that yeah. was pretty much the, the weakness for me or they all died black hair. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And yeah. this would have been late eighties, early nineties. Right, and, uh, right. I was, big chunky glasses, perhaps Doc not Martens. at that point. Yeah. No, luckily. Right. Um, mm-hmm. but yes, I was too postmodern for my own good, which, oh, you yeah. know, again, a number of aspects of, of, you know, what you were writing kind of yeah. vibe with me, which again, makes me feel good about myself because <laughs> I didn't have to spend the time writing. I, I could have this bullshit career instead uh-huh. and, and not actually produce lasting art like you have. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but was there a, a concern about, um, one downmanship, it, just a, a fear of, you know, I'm going to keep portraying myself in these, these, you know, oh, no, relationships no. Or, you know, I mean, I just, I know what it was like to actually live them. And yeah. I, and I know that, I did learn stuff. It's just, it took me a while. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I faded out where I did just because I didn't want to keep, you know, I just figured that people would understand that I'd hit a place where I could apply what I'd learned in this book to my next relationships. You know? Yeah. 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 I refer to it, uh, the gap right before that as the ex-girlfriend victory tour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was right. Before, basically 18 months before I met my, uh, my one true love. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, does the memoir presage Carter in ways that, um, let's, let me put it this way, reading it. Presage I, and Carter, that's sort of a pun, right? I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, did, it, did it give an impression or did you feel you were giving essentially clues as to the books that you would end up writing? Well. Or is it again more the <coughs> emotional reality of yourself and what you imbue in these characters? Because I wasn't getting the... Oh, well, this is where the guy would then go on to make Carter right. Beats the Devil and Sunnyside. And yeah. was that a deliberate move on your part or was no, it just well, earlier I, in your life? I mean, I I didn't know. Probably a surprise to me in these drafts was that it was going to have anything to do with writing. Mm-hmm. You know, I had no idea that the story of me becoming a writer would be any Because first of all, who the fuck cares, you know? And then second of all, I didn't really understand it as a coping mechanism. And I also didn't understand it as one of the things passed on from generations. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, medical terms better than I do. What is it when genetically something's passed down from generation to generation? We have the the well, the, uh, the, like, the, the haplo types and and things like that. But yeah, yeah, the, the you know, my my mom wanted to be a writer, and generations before her wanted to be writers, mm-hmm. and I wanted to be a writer because of that. And the question of whether I was doing it on my own or whether I was doing it in order to please her, to be her, to reflect her, all that sort of stuff, I didn't. Even though it was in my notes and my journals, it wasn't something that I had really thought was something that would be important. And so when I was when I finished a good draft of it, I did go back and I think, okay, should I give then clues to what I did next? And I didn't do anything overt with that for a number of reasons. But one of them is I figured if people wanted to find them, they could. Like for instance, there's something pretty obvious, which is uh I I uh, spent a lot of time alone when I was 12. Yeah. Carter, Blizzard, Jenks, all that sort of stuff, except mm-hmm. I did not have a Jenks. Um, but that was kind of the anticipation of constantly the fear of there being, you know, something terrible happening to me. And so, you know. But narrating it in the memoir, you don't say, and that is where this scene would come from someday when I wrote my great novel. But yeah, like, that's, that's, you know, yeah. who cares? Again. And yeah. also, I wouldn't assume that anybody picking up the memoir would have read the books, you know. Um, parents been in touch since the book came out oh my dad he lives about a three quarters of a mile that way and my father lives about 12 minutes from me we can go months without seeing each other (laughs) (laughs) which again is part of a story that i'm sure we'll end up sharing yeah this hour at some point yeah well i'm interested in that i mean uh no, uh, no, Herb, Herb and I, we, we get along well. I think he, uh, I think it was a lot to take in for him. Um, as he said, though, he feels he came across as a benign putz, uh, which is fair. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, he's been fine with it. Have not been in touch with my mom. Um, and, uh, who else? Uh, pretty much everybody else who's family members and, and the ex-girlfriends and seem to be pretty good with it. So far. Okay. Yeah. And no lawsuits or anything, which is always good. That I know of yet. I mean, it's early though, right? So, yeah. You know, oh, by the way, I have yeah. this. Nice. Message. Cool. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did serve. I'm papers. taking your coffee back in yeah. that case. Son of a bitch. Yeah. Uh, no, when I was in grad school, I, I had a side job serving papers. Yeah. Um, for a court, it was it was pretty weird because I was. Is that how you got over the fence here this way? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was also uh, shaved 
headed back then. So I was yeah. a six foot one, 150 pound spider, basically. Yeah. And people just invite me into their homes. Huh. It was the weirdest thing. I'm like, you know, this is how serial killers get away with it, right? You know, I'm like, you're just, I'm just some schlub who showed up and, and look pretty scary to me. But so I, yeah. one, one of my other early summer jobs was delivering subpoenas for my uncle, uh, Jerry. In oh, good. New York. So, so I knew I, we had a lot in common. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I did a little bit, a little bit of that. No one expects a 15 year old kid to have a subpoena with him. So, yeah. yeah. And that was the, Oh my God. Are you glad David Gold? Yes. Yeah, so here's your paper. You've been served. Yeah. Um, but the comics thing I think is where we have the, the most overlap. Oh, yeah. which, okay. Yeah. Um, I did want to tell you how thankful I was in the afterward that you you straightened out the negative zone subspace oh, good. thing yeah, from yeah. Fantastic Four because you saw it. And I was going to beat your ass. I yeah. know. Yeah. Well, like he's, he's just passing. That's no, no, no. I, I I know my shit, man. You know. Yeah. <laughs> when did that begin for you? Uh, the, comics. Yeah, the, the the comics and especially the the Kirby esque. Um, uh, let's era. see. Uh, you were born sixty four. Born in sixty four. So I was on a school bus in nineteen seventy two, and a school bus driver had. Many copies of uh, the Hulk from between issue 161 and 172 or so. Herb Trimpey ones. Oh, yeah. Come on. I mean, but how do you think I learned about Kirby? Well, as a pal of mine put it, Herb Trimpey answered the question of what would it look like if the Hulk was drawn by the Hulk? But... (laughs) You know, Thank I you. think that's unfair, though. I, know, I really, I, know. I think, you know, there were a lot of journeyman artists in the 70s. Yeah. There was Sal Buscema and there was Jim Mooney and there was a lot of guys who just, you know, they made the panels work. There are compositions, you know. It's the stuff I was raised on. I, and the, the rare stuff was Burn, Claremont, X-Men. Yeah, for yeah. Me, and the Miller, Jansen, Daredevils. Yeah. Part. There was a lot of shit leading up to that. In my, there was. My, yeah, well, I mean, there was kind of a return. I think that the 70s was the peak of... You know, at least at that time period of uh, artist driven, or excuse me, writer driven stuff. Because yeah. if you think of the Marvel stuff in the mid seventies, it's like Steve Engelhart. Yeah, Steve I was just going to say Engelhart, Gerber, and uh, yeah. Yeah, to a lesser extent, Mantlo. But yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. A little and Roy bit. Thomas was still Len Wein and Marvel Wolfman were doing some interesting yeah. stuff. Roy Thomas was doing some interesting stuff. But you don't really look at the art of Marvel in the seventies so much. And you know, from the time that like Barry Windsor Smith left until Byrne really hit his his marks. As being much of a uh, artist driven well I mean Perez was good uh doing the Avengers stuff, but it was it was as really, if he took once the, he went over to d c though is where he kind of yeah like, yeah, I feel up. like he yeah. was just taking the house style and doing a really good job with it um it's like colon i mean a huge I'm a huge colon fan now, that raises the question yeah. of artists who you did not dig when you were young who yeah. you came to appreciate later on because colon is one of those even Kirby yeah. when I was a kid. Being raised on burn and all yeah. that, Jack Kirby, yeah. especially Kirby mid to late seventies, sure. isn't good. Yeah. yeah, it took me into my late teen years. Yeah. For, oh, okay, now I get it now. Yeah, that, yeah. That this is you know. Well, so that. with Kirby, the for my experience, my exposure to him was all I think in one week. My my dad got me a copy of Origins of Marvel Comics, so I saw Fantastic Four one and Fantastic Four. 55 at the same time. And it's like, wait, who are these two different artists? Who are, you know, <laughs> because the beginning of that sort of Balkan un- underfed, you know, I guess it was George Klein or whoever it was who did the inking on one, which is this really primitive looking, no backgrounds. And then 55, which is everything is shiny and Sinnet like. I visited Joe Sinnet with, with, uh, with uh, Patrick McDonald a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, and Joe's great health and totally there he's great he's he was it was a great visit and a really lovely loving guy you can just he's 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 it's good to meet your heroes sometimes so i got that and at the same week uh therapist friend of the family handed me a copy of demon 16 which i believe was out that week and so it was like they had the kirby thing all three phases of jack's career and like say okay this is what he drew like in 1961 66 and 74 oh my god these are all the same guy this is crazy and demon scared the hell out of me oh it was was just nuts it's nuts creepy paranoid and you know trauma driven when you're a little kid it's it's tough to tell to understand what you're reading like the new gods stuff with kirby Mm -hmm. it it doesn't make any sense to like a nine-year-old no Uh, this is just big i don't understand yeah no i mean as a 54 year old it's you know i mean there's there's so many concepts and they're just shoehorned together i i always thought of uh the Silver Age stuff is Kirby's Ulysses. It's like it's 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 the yeah. Manhattan as everything, and then Finnegan's Wake it is, is you know, yeah. the new gods. Well, once he had his chariot the whole, of the gods yeah. moment, it all just, it's celestial, like, same thing. It's yeah, just, it's all yeah. just yeah. But um, but the guy, as far as like artists, I didn't like Ditko. I didn't like Ditko. Yeah, again, it was Kirby and Ditko. I didn't yeah. get when I was a kid. Yeah, 
even though I'd read the the or like the the little uh, mass market paperbacks in yeah. the first six issues of FF and Spider Man yeah. and things like that, uh, but yeah, it took getting older to get that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, and I can't think of other guys. Gil Kane. Gil Kane. I, I liked Gil Kane when I was younger too. I always yeah. I always thought of him also. That I mean, and I mean, it, I've also been helped out immeasurably as an adult by hearing Howard talk about him. Right. You know, um, because I didn't understand all the choreography and the, uh, you know, the. Uh, <laughs> it's Gil Kane is a musical, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, just just as a reader of it, I, he always struck me as a cut above Sal Buscema. Sal, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> don't worry, no one's listening. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, but then I, what I do find is the artists who I thought were again just sort of hitting their page count. I still feel the same way about them yeah. most of the time. You yeah, know, a lot like, of guys were just Ross Andrew was another yeah. one from the the 70s. It's yeah. just yeah, he drew. It was fine. Yeah. So yeah. my my so my first experience of like understanding like that there was a whole continuity to things was we had a friend of the family who was a therapist who in addition to taking me to see Barbarella when I was about eight which Solid. changed my life <laughs> he took me to Cherokee Comics in Hollywood and like you know here are back issues and yeah. they're a quarter each you know so I just got yeah. all my hulks back to Tales to Astonish back to about issue 60 I think that was 50 cents you mm -hmm. know and just like devoured everything so i could catch up and nice. back in the day when you could still do that yeah so with us it was all random we had a ham radio flea markets my old man would take us to and um because he was going there to sell defective radio equipment it's a story and uh, my brother and i would wander around there was a guy yeah. who always had uh, stripped uh, uh comics he lost the covers but you know we would just buy stacks yeah. of these things and just try to figure out from the numbers you know if we could get like a run of the x-men yeah sure the the early x-men again roy thomas and yeah. things like that yeah um yeah it's it's and you could continue to go back to the same place after your dad had sold defective radio parts there and... they had all these scams oh yeah it was, okay. a, it was a team of guys but the funny thing was he was just reminiscing about them recently and i i don't know if he's ever really appreciated that it's possible Everyone else was pulling these scams on mm -hmm. them too. Like yeah. there was just a, a room full of hustlers, you uh -huh. know. And, it, and yeah. you know, it wasn't the only guys to fake bid something up and and yeah. right. Yeah, um, well, these are guys who just live to to feel like they were getting a, uh, getting away with something. I, I guess I have a soft spot for that, but yeah, I yeah. mean, not yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, you, you recognize it. I recognize it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's it, it's a weird parental question i guess that comes out of of your book and the experiences i'm currently going through um uh, with my old man there are much worse stories of abuse neglect etc mm. however they tend not to involve the child still being in contact with the parents mm -hmm. through their their adult years i tell stories of of my upbringing and people are like oh my god that's and you're actually helping take care of him now? Like, yeah, yeah, I, that's mm -hmm. that's the irreconcilable part mm -hmm. is the, you know, this sort of behavior should have led to we're done, I'm out of here, mm -hmm. uh, which, again, it took you into your 30s to reach with your mother. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's that question of did that provide a degree of, I hate the term closure. Um, oh, dear God, don't use the word closure. No, a find, sense, find another one. Get a, a sense of completeness in your, your, your relationship with her. Or is it something where, you know, there's still going to be codas. You're still going to get, you know, a weird email and an attempt I've, at drawing you back into I've things. learned never to make predictions, yeah. you know. I mean, it's, you can't. It achieves a steady state by the end of the yeah, novel, well, that's, but, I one think, that, or the yeah, memoir, but, yeah. but one that's still... Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, a parent-child relationship, particularly a mother-child relationship, is complicated enough and genetically based enough and then also early childhood development based enough that it's not... You can't say something is over. I mean, that doesn't make much sense. But like to no, no, some people do that. I mean, they'll they'll cut off relations completely. I, and neither of us really. Oh, I mean, you, I, you, my, my relationships are cut off. I mean, I haven't talked to my mom in fourteen years. Yeah. So I mean, would you still get an occasional angry email around this? I uh, uh, there's a reference to something. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I mean. I get you. What, what, yeah. I, well, but to be specific about it, because I think that there's, I, I, I think I, I, I sense, I have sensed confusion about it sometimes when talking about it on previous interviews. Mm -hmm. 
I feel that the idea of just to say, you know, it's cut off, it's done. To me, I always have like an image of someone holding themselves up against a closet door that they're hoping is yeah, not going to open yeah. again, you know, but it's because protesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm not, uh, regardless of what anyone else might think, I'm not a monster, but the thing is what's resolved in my, in myself is that I don't have any responsibilities in that direction anymore. Yeah. And I don't feel that inexplicable need to do well. Uh, her happiness is not essential to my own. Right. Um, okay. And so that, that's, you know, that's where I'm at. I kind of have that level of detachment, you know, um, yeah. Which is good. I'm I'm fine with that. Again, you, you managed to convey everything that goes into getting you to that point. Good. Yeah. Over the course of... But, you know, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is though, like, I don't... Uh, uh, with my dad, you know, I, I you know, I, <laughs> I, you know, he goes to Costco and gets these uh, uh, propane refills that are at the bottom of the stairs and can't carry them up because he's 87 years old. Yeah. He's got Parkinson's and a brain tumor. And so he needs... And so I carry them up the stairs for him. Yeah. That's yeah. being a good son, you know, right. but, and also I happen to, uh, I like him. Then he makes a good steak on the other side of it, which is all good. Um, with, uh, with my mom, we don't have, we don't have contact yeah. and it's, and it's not something that, um, I'd want to pursue. Yeah. In my old man's case, it's that. So he's had a massive health failure in the yeah. past year, but, Beyond the helping him do all this stuff, mm -hmm. he's started with the, I just want forgiveness and absolution. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, that's, that's not happening. Good. But, you know, I'll, I'll be around to move stuff and yeah. do your therapy with you and all that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think everybody has to find their own level of what they're actually comfortable with. This was a huge yeah. lesson to me when I heard the word codependency and understood what it might mean for the first time was that you can't bend yourself out of who you actually are in order to be what someone else wants you to be, which is a lesson that I did not take in for a very long no, time. Which, again, we have a great deal in common <laughs> <laughs> besides the comic stuff. But, you yeah. know, um, you mentioned Joe Sinat. Uh, uh, meeting your heroes yeah. in general, did, did you have freak out moments around writers or comics people who... Oh. Younger days, maybe, uh, but the one I always fall back uh, on is when I recorded with Irvin Welsh. Uh, yeah. He stood up David Bowie twice because <laughs> he was so nervous. He said, "I can't interview a guy whose posters I had on my wall when I was a teenager. I can't do it." And oh, oh, it's a shame. I know that's a big shame. <laughs> like, oh, and of all people, you'd think yeah. this was, you know, I think Bowie would be very forgiving of that. You'd oh, yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, Moby's yeah. got a story of meeting Bowie where yeah. he, Moby himself is completely intimidated yeah. in the mid nineties. Um, after a show and he's just literally like being brought up a dais by Trent Reznor to, to yeah. meet Bowie as though he's, he's receiving some blessing, which Moby's entirely down with. He's, he's, <laughs> oh my God, I'm being blessed by David Bowie. Um, but yeah, that one particular person I can imagine it's, yeah. it's weird and intimidating. I don't, I, uh, but did you have those sorts of, or did you go to enough book readings and be part of publishing culture enough that people came off like Joe? Ultimately? Well, you know, I mean, the thing as writers is that it's, Writers are such uh, non-famous people. It's really hard to get intimidated on a certain level. I mean, if you really like somebody's work, I guess when I was probably the, well, maybe this, so when I was 17 or so, um, I was, when I was at Wesleyan, uh, I went to go see John Irving read uh, for the Hotel New Hampshire tour. And he was, at, he came to Wesleyan and I was the first person there in the room. I was there like 45 minutes early and like was sitting there. Couldn't believe I was going to like meet my hero. And he came in and he did his reading and he asked for questions. Boom, my hand go up and I didn't have a question. Ah, I have a five minute statement. I did one of those <laughs> things, man. I just, I wanted to ask a question about, because he had seen a rough cut of the movie of Garp, but hadn't, Garp had not come out yet. And I think I was going to just ask him how satisfied he was with seeing his work translated, you know, whether it made sense to him or not. And, but of course I was not articulate about it. I just had this, just went on and on and on, you know, <laughs> sun goes down, moon comes up. I'm still speaking. People are reading newspapers all around me. I'm envisioning that horror thing too, where you see the, yeah, the reverse zoom. The yeah. Person. Right. Of me, you know, <laughs> and then finally it just sort of uh, like that ended. And then he just, this is what he did. No. <laughs> That audience erupted in the laughter, and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that was pretty bad." 
Uh, so yeah, that's, got over got over your heroes. At that I point? got over my heroes at that point. I mean, I can't think of a lot of other people. I mean, when I was a little kid, I I was I went to a performance of Groucho Marx um, when he did his. Uh, it was after Carnegie Hall when he was in L.A. and he'd already kind of started to lose his mind. That's Max. That's Max, hey, Max. the half man Maine Coon cat. Um, Max just discovered raccoons a couple days ago and we're very upset about it. We hope we, we, we had hoped that he would be smart enough not to go try to meet his towards his them. Okay. Cause I would think something that size, he would kind of, no, you'd think, but yeah. he's kind of dumb. Okay. So. Sorry, Max. But, uh, for them, Groucho was losing his mind. Groucho was losing his mind a bit. So we didn't actually go back to try to talk to him or anything afterwards, but I can't really think of anybody who I got, uh, intimidated out of, uh, talking to. I met Kirby once. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, his last San Diego show. And I went and I talked to him briefly. Uh, nicest guy in the world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I had a, uh, Al Jaffe <laughs> at a society of illustrators. I'm pals with Drew Friedman and oh, Drew yeah. attracts a circle of, of good artists and weirdos. Sure. Yeah. Like me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but met Al, you know, uh, thanked him for being Al Jaffe all yeah. these years. And I'm, I'm walking away, and there's a, a guy standing down the hall. He's like, is that, is that Al Jaffe? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is. Oh, my God. Like, my entire sense of humor was, like, built by that guy. I'm like, you know what? Go over there and tell him that. Mm -hmm. because I know he's 96 years old, and I yeah. know he's heard it a million times. <laughs> yeah. But you're not going to get a chance to do this again, probably. Yeah. So just let him know. Yeah. And, and he's like, yeah, man. And just, just makes a beeline <laughs> right for him. What else is Al there for? But, you know, for that. Um which is not as good as the previous Society of Illustrators event I went to uh, for for Drew when he had the old Jewish comedians. Paintings. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We yeah. um, went for the the opening night, and I got a tour of the lower floor by Robert Klein, which yeah. which is one of the greatest. It was just me and him, and oh, I just wow. went to show him where his his portrait was, wow. Wow. and he just started walking me around, telling stories about all of the old oh, Jewish comedians there. Like, he must have had great stories. Oh my God, I was dying. Yeah. Um, the other great part was, uh, I was there somewhat early because I'm insane. <laughs> and um, someone comes in to tell Drew, I, I think Joe Franklin is outside. I'm not <laughs> sure. And, and should I bring him in? He's like, no, he's not going to come in until somebody recognizes him out there. So I, I told Drew I would go out there and say, excuse me, are you Joe Franklin? So he could say, no, no, no pictures. And then storm into the, the society because there's a certain, yeah, yeah. sure. I just realized the story that I should have told you about, uh, about meeting people. Of course, it was when, uh, this was 1989, 88, 88, roughly, uh, uh, document came out by rem yeah. and they were on tour and uh we had backstage passes um and i at the time had this giant stupid cowboy hat and i was going every time a big like if stone uh who else was there jay mcinerney uh tana janowitz uh any any writer who i wanted to go go see i'd bring the big stupid cowboy hat have them wear it yeah. and then take pictures of them and that and uh so i brought the big stupid cowboy hat to the show and we went, I went backstage afterwards and this is when I was dating the person Lindsay. Who, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I just went backstage and I took pictures of, of R.E.M. wearing the, the big stupid cowboy hat, except Michael Stipe who had held it beside himself when he was talking to me. But I had, I ended up having a fairly lengthy conversation with Michael Stipe. This is after the whole Cuyahoga stuff that's in the book. Yeah. yeah it's a few albums later, right? Yeah. It was, this was a, an entire one album later, but it felt like, you know, uh, a, a lifetime given how- it was Life's uh, Rich Pageant, right? Life's Rich Pageant. Yeah. And then and Document was the second. Oh, was I the thought follow. Fables came out after- It was, uh, no, Pageant. Fables was the one right before. Oh, that's right. So yeah. it was like- Because uh, we were Chronic Town murmur reckoning uh fables, yeah. and then <laughs> life search pageant uh and then document and then i started to fade out of being interested uh, well that's what they they major labeled with green and yeah yeah i it's funny i don't think it was the major label thing that changed so much as i just think that whatever um i think that you were in college and grad school yeah right? yeah exactly i yeah. mean there's a certain amount of just like you're hearing things for the first time yeah. that they make a deep deep impression on you you know but now i go back and go oh my god what was i thinking with echo and the bunny men what, what yeah what but come that? on we were nerds yeah i know yeah <laughs> it was true indie, you know, it, before there uh, was an indie it was college radio yeah as we knew it yeah you know? yeah and i i i had a lot of course rm was the ultimate kind of band like that for a long time and uh my girlfriend heidi was hugely into rem and um at wesleyan and we saw them in a bar in Connecticut in 1983. They opened for the English Beat 
and there was like 500 people there. I will still listen to Special Beat Service at least once a week. I <laughs> heard it <laughs> last night at a flea market. Yeah. Uh, we walked by it. There, I'll put the whole album on uh, again. Okay. It's it's bizarre. They're to playing Soul it. Salvation when we went by. There you go. Yeah. Save uh, it for later. Still, yeah. I think one of the greatest songs ever. That is a fantastic song. Um, and. But you saw REM opening. I know. Yeah, anyway, but 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 so I saw yeah, I saw REM, REM a couple of times. But I did talk to Michael Stipe after the Cuyahoga thing, and I knew at that moment there's no way I could explain. There's no, just not a, you would come off like a psychotic. Exactly. Yeah, not a fucking way. So I just said, look, <laughs> there's a whole episode in here about a psychic connection, sort of about this song. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and I just yeah. I felt that. As they say, discretion being the better part of valor. I just, I just said, look, you know, you guys have a PO box because at some point I'm going to have a book I need to send you about this. And he said, yeah, sure. And that's a sign of progress too. You've gone from 17 year old embarrassing yourself in front of John Irving. Yeah. To, so that you, again, we found a, a <laughs> yeah, right. Yourself right. A Very slowly over time, I learned how to not embarrass myself in front of people who are more established. And uh, and yeah. Some people never get that. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable. But yeah. has the it's a weird question. Has the interview process Open anything up to you uh, over the course of doing interviews about this book? Have you huh. have you uncovered anything, or in the process of talking through stuff? I know sometimes you know you have set pieces. Yeah, everybody sure. Does when they're they're promoting stuff, but yeah. um, has it been any sort of you know what I didn't realize until I started talking about it to oh. all these people? <sighs> yeah, this is interesting. Uh, Oh, this is embarrassing because this is something I figured out like a couple of days ago in talking about the book that I hadn't really seen before and I'm losing what it was. But here's a sm there's a smaller thing involved in it, which is a structure thing, which is just that uh, – oh, I know what it was. I was reading aloud because I read the same section aloud every time I read the first chapter aloud because it's just a very good introduction to the book and mm -hmm. it's a good place for people to jump on or jump off. And uh, I hadn't realized until – 15th time I read it aloud that that ends with me talking about uh, wanting to fall asleep. Which brings us to the thing that happens near the end, yeah. which we won't talk about. Right. But yeah. 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 Which is like, oh, right. The end of the book is me falling asleep. Duh. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hadn't really realized that. And it's like, oh, that's dumb. <laughs> you know, yeah. but there's there's authorial intention. You know, on, yeah. on the way here, I was listening to the only podcast that's actually the only episode of a podcast that's on my iPhone because mm -hmm. I'm in a rental car. I was just charging yeah. my phone. It started playing. Um, Marin interviewing David Mamet. Oh, huh. Uh, which I knew I'd wanted to listen to a while back and mm -hmm. apparently still left it on my phone, mm -hmm. um, where it's all authorial intent. The mm -hmm. actors don't even mean anything. Uh -huh. It's it's You're just reading my lines. Some people and work that way. I yeah. mean, I know that Nabokov talk about fictional trees, you know, shedding their leaves in fear when they've sensed his presence coming by and stuff. Yeah. And I'm just not that type of person. I mean, to me... I'm a much, I don't know, I'm more of a socialist or something. I just, I, I, I have a feeling of collaboration and part of the, and since I'm, since I am the authorial presence in a book, uh, I always think of the reader's part of being, you know, what they bring to it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I should ask, because well, listening to some of the previous interviews you've done, you've mentioned as part of getting the, the book into shape, mm -hmm. you were essentially doing like stand up mm -hmm. routines of it. How much, how important is that performative aspect in terms of, you know, the writing and how is that sort of audience reaction the, the same or different than a reader reaction? Given yeah. The readers uh, in isolation? This is still a work in progress for yeah. understanding it because it's new for me. For what? I don't want to uh, say the whole thing sounds like a stand-up routine. It doesn't. No, I, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, I, so I'm really good at reading. I'm really good at reading in front of crowds. And one of the reasons why is I listen really well to how to room tone. And mm. so uh, in this case, the draft I'd written that was bad, I, you know, the, what, the interviews you're referring to, I talk about basically a process, bad draft. I rescued a couple of pages. I felt there was something in them. I would sign up for open mic nights that night. I was living out in Point Reyes Station, um, which is north of San Francisco, about an hour. And it's a very small rural community that has a lot of open mic nights because most of the people there are retired, successful people. And mm -hmm. retired, successful people and open mic nights are those three-word phrases that go together in really horrifying ways. <laughs> and yeah. so a lot of people would be out there reading their poetry and stuff. And I would sign up for five minutes. 
I would write something new in the afternoon and I'd read it aloud and I'd just listen to the way people reacted and I'd find, okay, people feel like they're on board now. Okay. I lost them with that line. What's, what's going on here. And part of the influence of that was the Jerry Seinfeld's documentary comedian, um, trying to get a good 10 minute set, how hard that is. And it became very important for me because I realized that if I'm making myself a character, I have to know how I play with people. Um, and so, uh, that became essential to building a, a Glenn as a narrator, uh, and then also understanding how people would react. So I read, I would say I did that more than five and fewer than 10 times, but I did it with different sections of the book to understand, and not just the funny parts that were standard, but just, just here's a dramatic section. Okay. Are people it, but, yeah, coughing? Monologue. Are yeah. they, yeah. you know, are they ordering drinks? You know, yeah. what are they doing? And to hear how wrapped they were or not. And, uh, I've done that in the process. I mean, I did that when writing Carter. I did that when writing Sunnyside, but not, I didn't lean on the audience as much as I did this time. Hmm. And it really does correspond in those terms. And they, I just think of it as, well, I guess the difference between writing a play and writing prose, mm -hmm. you know, that, that communal audience versus the singular reader. But you feel it, uh, it benefited you in terms of, feel, of writing. Yeah, I feel it really did. I mean, I feel, uh, and then also, you know, I did the audio book of this and it was crazy. I, uh, I got up, did my first day's work, did my second day's work. And then the guy who ran the studio came in and the engineer and the director were like, Hey, I don't know how to tell you this. We're ahead. I'm like, what do you mean you're ahead? <laughs> we're ahead. <laughs> They'd booked me for, what was it? Seven days expecting it would take 10 and it took six and it took back to like five and a half. And then it was time for me to do pickups. They brought me in and said, we don't have, you know, this is weird. Not a whole lot here. Six. You have six pickups, you know, <laughs> 175,000 words, six. Um, and part of it was because I'd read this fucking thing aloud a yeah. million times and to the audience. And then also uh, there's a kind of fuel for me in reading this, which there is not in reading fiction, which is that fiction is, stuff that I've made up that I'm hoping that you dig. This is my actual life, you know? Yeah. And so there's, I have a certain vitality and interest in making sure that people are on board. What did you learn from the audiobook process? Was there <laughs> anything about reading or tone that, uh, uh, or technique that they, uh, they imparted on? Stand up, uh, instead of sitting down, uh, it's on the diaphragm, keep your energy going. Uh, I would say, that I, again, figured out how to play with my audience because I could see the engineer and Were the director reacting? reacting. Yeah. Oh, no yeah. shit. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I could never, I would never know if, you know, that's the sort of thing that they're just, you know, whatever. It's, it's just punching the clock versus Well, they both, they both from the first cool. day were telling me that it was a good experience to to hear it aloud and that they were having a good time with it. So, Had there yeah. been a thought of having somebody else do the, oh, yeah. the reading? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you fight for it or was yeah. it a, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hard fight. I mean, they realized they could pay me less. So yeah. It was yeah. pretty we easy. To hire somebody else. Oh, <laughs> done. Yeah. Scale. This I, is I think I might've, I might've might sent them a YouTube video of me reading or something like that. I don't remember. Cause it was so they knew that I actually had a voice. But, yeah. yeah. I don't remember. Did you still have a voice by the end of the whole process? Yeah. Yeah. Where, totally. Oh, that was, that was the other thing. No, that was the thing is like they said, so we've been doing these, you know, I've been comparing you at 9am and you at three and it's the same thing. It's just, you know, okay. So, yeah. I mean, as I said, they said, are you going to be okay talking aloud for six hours a day? And I said, well, what am I going to do the other 14 hours? I'm usually talking aloud. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Launch your own podcast. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't launch your own podcast. <laughs> no, me. no, no, no. That's no, the worst no. goddamn thing in the, in the world. Yeah, no. If I were to launch a podcast, it would be called The Art That Ruined Me. Uh, and it would just be interviews with artists about the piece of art they couldn't get right. Tell me yours. Uh, my first four novels. <laughs> um, you, <laughs> you, know, you document them pretty well. I document well them pretty well in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to salvage at all. No, God, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. the first 40 pages of uh, the book that I used, I, I got into oh, yeah. it. You, you mentioned I got into graduate after. school with it because it was a good, like, divorced from what I actually intended. Like, I now know what was happening was that those first 40 pages were a setup for the story I actually wanted to tell, which was a terrible and stupid story. But, like, to get me there, I had, like, used kind of traditional detective fiction sort of tropes to get in mm -hmm. without really knowing what I was doing. And now looking at it again, I'm like, oh, this is passable. Like you read this 
And it doesn't there's have a guy who's a writer. There's here. a guy who's a writer here who's about <laughs> to tell a really stupid story, but doesn't know it. So. Yeah. You should. I, I gave you a, a short book by Stefan Zweig yeah. um, as, as one of my, my and thank gifts. You. Um, there Wait, are, there's more? You, there is a collection of just the short fiction. It's, oh. it's a brick. Yeah. But the framing devices and mechanisms he uses to set yeah. up stories that lead you thinking it's going in one direction yeah. and then the real story unveils itself. It's a little like Scoop, uh, the Evelyn Waugh one, where it's... I haven't read that one. Oh, first it? 10 pages, you yeah. think you're getting this hard-bitten veteran newspaper guy being sent off somewhere and all. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that's all blind. You're actually getting this this other character who, you know, happened to wander through a scene mm. at one moment, and then boom, he's the center of everything. Um, which, you know, it's, it's yeah. funny in its way yeah. to, to pull that off. But what's writing practice like for you? I have a terrible work ethic. Yeah. Um, You've done two books in... in I've done three, three, three books three in 18 books years. years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's not very much. Um, <laughs> I wander around blindly for a long time. I mean, I... Uh, metaphorically? Uh, yeah, metaphorically. Um, I mean, you have sections of that in, in the memoir, too. Of Yeah. Yeah, I... I uh, I work in like three week bursts. Like I can keep up something for three weeks where I'll have a process where, okay, now six days a week, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go do other things. But after three weeks, life intercedes. Uh, I lose my thread. I need to stop. I need to approach things from a different angle. And so there's times when I'm really, really productive where those three week bursts lead to me finishing a lot of things. And then there's times where I just like have a lot of open files in those three weeks and they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Are there things you tend to revisit? Oh yeah, all the time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty. I mean, there's I, you know, I'm I'm like like uh, <laughs> to say David Gilmore never threw out an idea he liked for a guitar solo. Like, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> like David Gilmore that way. There'll still be a couple of notes left from you know, know sixteen. Except it's not entirely true because I um, I read Fitzgerald's diaries. And a number of those are just like he would do these extensive metaphors and you know, say he was going to use them some more. He uses zero of them anywhere. And I realized that a lot of times it's just, no, you got this thing floating. You're never going to use it anywhere. But part of the practice is just writing it down. And you just had to, to get it out. Okay. Yeah. But you don't have a set routine. Otherwise, it's just desperation that drives you occasionally. Yeah, desperation needing to make a buck. Uh, but I, I also sometimes, you know, well, that's not entirely true. You know, uh, everything is so holistic and vague that that you know, I sometimes like you know when I finished this and I realized it was done, I made a list of okay, what's my next project, and I have like twenty five different things I could do. And I, you know, make an A and a B and a C of them and like what would be most fun to do, what would be most likely to do, what would be hardest to do and what am I most driven to do? And sometimes those things line up and sometimes they don't. And sometimes it's an idea of, okay, I'm not driven to do this, but it would be easy and it would be a good stepping stone to get me to the next thing I want to do. So why not, you know, you've written for podcasts, you've written a couple of comics, mm -hmm. genre or form you really dig the most oh, or yeah. something you really want to try next. Uh oh, I'm uh I've also written screenplays uh like everybody who lives in California. Yeah, um, well that's a given. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean it's part of the driver's <laughs> test. I seriously you know? come to L.A. for thirty to seventy hours at a time yeah. when I have San Diego business, and yeah. everyone I meet yeah. is just. Well, my hairdresser has a screenplay we're working on. Yes, of course. Dog Walker. And, yes, yeah. yes, yes, I know. And I'm, In fact, Max was trying to give me some pages just now. There was, are, <laughs> and, and believe it or not, there's there's people lining up uh, outside to that, that gate that we have up. That's not to keep the kitten in. Ah, people sense, people trying to get Max to get his screenplays there. Everybody, everybody has them also. But the thing is, I really, really like film. I really, really like TV. I like film sets. I like TV sets. I mean, I like the idea of collaborating with people. Um, when I got, yeah, actually, how is that the collaborative creative process versus the solo aspect of yeah. prose writing? So, like you know, um, I wrote a comic that Gene Colan drew, um, and that was the first comic I wrote. And the collaboration with her was you know talking to my editor was Diana Schutz uh, at Dark Horse, and then uh, Diana Schutz just added me on Facebook. In oh. fact, um, <laughs> that's funny. Well, it's part of my. I'm around 280 something episodes in, and I'm trying to figure out what to do for 300, which oh, yeah. is the final one this year. Oh. And um, the two funny ones that have come up uh, one person 
suggested Frank Miller mm-hmm. because 300. Huh. Um, I forget the other the other great goofy idea someone had for for that anniversary one. But I mentioned to a <clears throat> pal of mine in comics, you know, I met Frank many years ago at a party. Um, it was actually great because I didn't know he was Frank Miller yeah. until maybe 20 minutes into our conversation yeah. where I realized, oh, right, yeah. So by Lynn, you mean Lynn Farley. <laughs> oh, and yeah, by yeah. Vermont, you mean you're Frank Miller. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know my stuff? I'm like, yeah. Uh. I, it meant a lot to me in high yeah. school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> it was 2003. So yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just about the yeah, point of right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but th- at the time, the Dark Knight was yeah. the thing for me. Again, I would I would have been 15, 16 when the Dark Knight and the Watchmen yeah. were coming out. Yeah. You're a little bit older, um, yeah. so it wouldn't have had quite the same nerd. Yeah. alienated teen resonance. Yeah, no, for me, it was definitely a college kid reading it lately. lately. Yeah. But like, I, I'm really interested, you know, one of the things I get interested in is artists' careers after their first act is over, where they go and why and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And do they repeat themselves? Do they, you know, I think about all the different ways you can go, like, you know, Paul McCartney sort of getting soft, like getting... AOR, yeah, and then Jonathan Richman like going and writing Abominable Snowman in the supermarket after Roadrunner and stuff, and like getting, and then eventually coming around to a place where he's like in his prime, and no one listens to him. You know, this, this will sound on the face of it, kitsch. There's this amazing Billy Joel interview mm-hmm. in Vulture, the New York Magazine. Oh, I thing. believe it. He's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and he. He doesn't, you know, uh, he always has a, I'm not criticizing, but yeah. he's like, Paul McCartney, yeah. he's still chasing radio play. Yeah. He's like 70 something years old. He's yeah. done everything. Because the whole question was, why have you, Billy Joel, not recorded anything since yeah. 1993? Yeah. So they, the uh, label screwed up my last album. Yeah. I know the world has changed enough that I'm not going to chart anything. I'm not going to bust my ass. And and work yeah. on an album and put something out there that I know no one's going to support and it's not going to get listened to. And then there was a footnote pointing out that one quarter or one third of all tracks that he had ever released had mm-hmm. charted in the U.S. <laughs> and it was one of those like that number is you know, here compared yeah. to anyone else in, in history being yeah. down, down there. Yeah. And, yeah, he just had a, you know, I don't need to be part of that that treadmill. Why sure. Paul McCartney feels a need to keep proving that, I, I don't understand. Yeah, it's interesting to me because also it's not it's not like there's any breaks in McCartney doing that. Like yeah. he can just do that forever if he wanted to. Right. He's Paul McCartney. So, I'm, you know, do you do the thing of, well, actually, I, I put it in Sunnyside. This is conversation between Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford where – Chaplin just wants to put out perfect pieces of work, and Mary Pickford is like, "No, you put out a movie every two weeks. You just do it. You put out a movie every month. Whatever, whether yeah. you just do it. And if they don't like this one, they'll like the next one. If they don't like the next one, there'll be another one coming in the pike. It's like you just, you just do it. Mm-hmm. And I don't have an argument with either way. Those are both interesting kind of ways of doing things. I think that the, I think Chaplin's way is a little more withholding and a little, the way I wish I were not. You know, I was going to ask how how does it parallel. Again, two novels. I am exactly like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah. And those eyebrows, that's what's killing yeah, me. Yeah, I know. It's pretty, it's pretty spooky, isn't it? I mean, it? the bowler hat was a giveaway from the beginning, but, well, but still. Well, you know, it could have been an affectation. Uh, uh, I, you know, I I like the idea of just, like, get shit out there and just, like, you know, keep on keep on making things. It's just that I happen to make things sort of slowly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think of myself as slow. I, I do whip out drafts pretty quickly. It's just in between... A lot of stuff happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Um, oh, collaboration. Yeah. yeah collaboration right. versus solo. Yeah. So when I talked to Gene Colan um, on the phone for the first time with the script, Gene was famous for never finishing a script before he started illustrating it. He would, he starts, he would start reading a script and then get excited and start drawing it. Okay. So he cracked open my script and he was like, Glenn. I got a, I got a problem here. I got this, I got this problem with your script. I I need to know. I just need to know this thing here. All right. And he's calling me and it's midnight my time. It's he's in Vermont or New York, I guess at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. He's yeah. yeah. Just started working on your script. I'm like, okay, three o'clock in the morning. You're 82. Sure. If it works for you at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Totally fine. And, and he's like, uh, so here's the thing. You've got this 
I got this thing. It's got this really weird story you got here, Glenn. Okay, so there's a guy, and he's going, he's tunneling underground, and he's going from coffin to coffin, and he's rescuing these kids out of the coffins, and he gets up, and he's blinded by the sunlight when he gets out. And I was like, yeah. And he said, all right, that's fine, but on page one, it was midnight. I'm like, oh. No. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Gene. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Gene understood the release of information in a way I didn't, which is that I was wrote I wrote the script as if I was writing a novel, which is this piece of information is important than this one than this one. He knew visually to, to yeah. switch all this shit up, and so did uh, Edward Rizzo when I wrote uh, the Spirit thing. Like he and we had we had almost no discussion whatsoever. Yeah. He just like he just took what you had. He took what I had and it, like gave me back something different. I'm like, wait, this is oh, this is way better. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, how yeah. much of a learning curve was scripting? Just, you know, through the roof. I mean, you, you, know, you have yeah. some of those IDW books. I don't know yeah. if you've got the... And I bought it before they, yeah. they did the... Uh, it was a graffiti edition a million yeah. years ago yeah. of The Watchmen, which has yeah. Moore's... The script for the first issue oh, of yeah. The Watchmen, uh -huh. in, huh. where it's maybe three or four pages before the first panel. No, oh, is it? Is <laughs> which is great, because I interviewed yeah. David Lloyd a couple of months ago, oh, the guy yeah. who drew V for Vendetta. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that was early in both of their careers. Yeah. Moore had been around two or three years at that point. And I said, did he do stuff that detailed? Yeah. No, I never <laughs> would have let him do anything like that. <laughs> if he handed me five pages for one panel, I'd say, Alan, you take care of the word balloons. Yeah. I'll take care of the visual. We'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, they said it worked because they were so early in their their lives but yeah. but yeah it's um i imagine again it, it's different than screenplay writing yeah. doing a comic because it's you know again it's another pair of hands that is mm -hmm. going to interpret but not simply storyboard something that yeah. has to be you know a page as a unit that's yeah uh, yeah i mean i've seen some scripts i uh I've, some some writers have sent me scripts that they've written for and i'm I'm flabbergasted by how much detail they put in yeah. to to uh, to the writing side of uh, of comics, but it makes completely complete sense because there's just like a way of revealing information that's different from what I'm used to. There's also an ownership aspect yeah. there that they want to feel like, hey, it wasn't just the artist. I yeah. I did all this. I stuff. can see that. Yeah. yeah, that that's been a undercurrent apparently within the collaborative comics sort of world. Um, well, Stan yeah. and Jack, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's say no more. Oh, Enough man. said. Yeah, the thing that just kills me is that Ray Wise and Mark Maron aren't close enough in age oh. that they could play Jack and, and Stan, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the biopic. That's I, funny. I, I, would, I would be all yeah. over that. But um, what's L.A. mean to you? <laughs> you started here. You lived in San Francisco. You had a little East Coast experience. But... Well, uh... That's a good question. It's changed recently again. Um, so I was born in I was born in Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Hollywood uh, that later got taken over by the Scientologist, and it was it's it was always like a place to me in my head. It's like a blank slate, no history. It's it's mm -hmm. whatever you want it to be, and in part that changed when I was writing Sunnyside, just because I started to understand the cultural history of Los Angeles a little better, and I. You know, there's there's things that uh, when you grow up here, they're just so obvious and transparent. You don't realize they're actually there. You yeah. know, like, yeah. oh, there's a beach. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what does that change about industry around here? What does it change about a you know, sense of leisure time when you can go up to the mountains, the beach, do all these different things? And then, uh, you know, when I grew up here, again, the idea is that constantly fighting with this idea that there's no culture and my parents were big art collectors at the time, so they collected all these artists that are now part of the culture. You know, I mean, Chris Burton was, you know, that was uh, that was, uh, was a guy that uh, I remember they were going to a cocktail party he was at, and I was not allowed to come because he was still recovering from having been shot. You know, right? <laughs> Parents were worried about his sanity. Like uh, oh, that was the one time they tried to protect you. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, protect me. <laughs> right, that spoke well of them at that one particular moment. But now they were not. I'm you know, kidding, I know, but it's the thing is, is that I do. It is one of the weird things about giving interviews about this book right now is that a few times people have been have kind of launched into this shame based sort of thing about how could your parents do this or do that, and like a. I survived, you know, just fine. And also a lot of these experiences were pretty good for me. And then we live in a society now where a kid can't like walk out of the room without the parent following them. Yeah. And then also, you know, 
I was not a kid separated from my parents at the border, you know. And right. again, and, uh, things could have been so much worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I had it pretty cush, um, but I, and I feel like my parents did protect me from some stuff. Uh, it could have gone a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. it, it, the nature of media is going to focus on the most salacious details, yeah. and and you know, how did you feel about this, that, and the other? Yeah. I had one. One podcast, I pitched the cartoonist, and she said, well, I hope you're better than Terry Gross was. <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't think that's feasible at all. She apparently, Terry Gross, expected a certain emotional um, thing from this cartoonist, yeah. and she was not into that, and that just failed to hit. So she and I had a, a nice conversation no. where she told me I was better than Terry Gross. <laughs> you know, it's a little thing nice. that's yeah, my horn. Yeah, but yeah. Did you ever want kids? No. Was that a result of your upbringing, or do you feel there are other aspects that also mitigated against that? Well, were you afraid of turning into your parents? I asking for a friend. Yeah, no, I mean, just trying to be as honest as I can with this. Was uh, something you met an hour ago? <laughs> no, no, like oh, I, with yourself? I, I mean, I have you know, think about it all the time. Well, now, I mean, I am shocked when I see that. People are having children now. Why would you do that? That's utterly insane to have children right now. If you yeah. don't, if you're not, if you don't physically for some reason have to have a child, I'm speechless that yeah. somebody would, 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 dis, would willingly decide to, to like have a kid at this point, just because obviously, because right now, uh, it's the end of the world as we know it. Apparently it is. Yeah. It's, uh, I just, we got to keep bringing REM. Yeah, I know. Stuff. Yeah. And uh, God, how innocent that song sounds. Um, like, but before that, uh, I didn't think, I didn't really understand the, the, the attraction to having a kid that much. Mm -hmm. And then I like the quiet life, you yeah. know, um, uh, I like being able to sleep in and I like being able to have the time to work. And, uh, and Sarah, my girlfriend is totally, she's right on board with this. She does not want to have kids either Has the same feeling about it. She likes doing her work and likes, uh, likes making art and likes, um, uh, not having to think about the world coming to an end anytime soon. You know? yeah. And at your advanced age, yeah. um, you know, having a kid now would be, you know, college. When well, my dad married. did that. I mean, he had a kid when he was 54, I think. Yeah, he yeah. married rich too. He did. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> which was... <laughs> great part of the book um the collector impulse you've got yeah. a lot of you know wonderful original do have comic little, art and yeah, other things. i assume yeah. there's just nice books too um what do you grab if there's a fire oh <laughs> cats yeah but yeah. Are, is there anything physical any uh, any of the art that you would, uh, or a book that you would probably let's see uh because i seriously have a path worked out through my house where i pick up the clive james uh, uh galleys that he signed to me back in 2015 uh, yeah. as well as this one hard drive that i keep next to it so that i can oh essentially, everything else can go up those are the things that i'd, I'd consider i've you know. got uh uh now my brother's house burned up he said you you this is a completely academic exercise because when it happens you get your children out and that's it so, really that's what you, you, know, you get the cats out i'd get my gray i'd probably out. get the cats out yeah i mean uh i've got uh, three kirby covers that would probably come out yeah. you know yeah favorite kirby character hulk no shit oh yeah 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 okay. yeah it's actually weirdly the one piece one one thing i do not have any kirby art of is the hulk there isn't a ton. There's the well, so there's the first five issues and the first two nobody knows where they are. The middle three are out there and broken up. Uh, there's not a lot of great Hulk pages on there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I issue mean, it, three it goes over to, to Severin and and it, Ditko did one of the early ones. Too. Yeah, Ditko did did issue six and it was a great looking issue. Um, and then when Kirby came back, he and he did layouts or he did the Hulk again. You know, with um, like Esposito finishes or Ramita finishes back when he was tails to. Uh, Tales Astonish. of Astonish. But it didn't have the same feeling as the first six issues. He drew the character a little bit differently. Um, so that's, you know, that's not as, you know, as, as strong. And what the weird thing to me about the Hulk was going back and realizing it wasn't Kirby who figured out the formula of um, uh, Matter Hulk gets, Stronger Hulk gets, so that he's mm -hmm. turns into the Hulk when he's angry. Yeah. Because that would be a perfect Kirby trauma thing to have. Uh, it's exactly the type of thing he would do with a super soldier or something like that. That Ditko figured it out. Yeah. It was something I didn't realize until fairly recently. Well, the one that killed me a few years yeah. ago, I went back and started reading the old Thor yeah. comics. And uh, they clearly had no idea what the hell they were doing. No, no, because no, Don, no. It's never clear if Don Blake knows or doesn't know that nope. he's 
he's Thor or if he was this whole time and didn't understand. Yeah, so yeah. it was just one of those. And then yeah. they all spoke in mock Shakespearean, which also makes no sense for Nordic gods. But no, no, what no. Else, you know? no. And then, yeah. And then they didn't. But and they didn't speak that way for the first like 20 or 30 issues. It yeah. took a while to catch on. That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably what I would end up grabbing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I've, I've started putting up a, a wall of art now, and the only key ones that I have are Joe Chardello's uh, illustrations of Henry Miller and Philip Roth. Oh, I nice. had to, to grab on the way out. Nice. But, um, and they're conveniently located by the front door, so that yeah. way I can I can just pull those two. Do, do you collect other art? Do you have other things too? Um, not a ton of comic art. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll get sketches and drawings from Jim Woodring, Jaime yeah. Hernandez, people nice. like that. Um, I've got a couple of prints of Woodring. I have a collection of six prints of women's portraits by mm. Lorenzo Matotti that mm. um, you know, those pastels that Matotti was um, did predominantly for his, mm. his fashion stuff. And mm. I, I was in a, a comic store in Brussels because mm. I was there for a trade show. Lambia. What am I going to do but go to mm. Bruxelles mm. and take the metro all the way out to the station that mm. Hergé painted the the mural yeah. for for the entire train station. Oh, right, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, God forbid I go hang out in a, a beer lounge or something. <laughs> um, and I, I saw this portfolio of, of Matoti um, portraits, and I left. And I was maybe 50 feet down the sidewalk, and I thought, Gil, what the hell? <laughs> You're never going to see this again. You have to buy this. I don't care how the euro is against the dollar. <laughs> At the time, it was pretty strong. Mm -hmm. I just went in, bought it, paid more for framing than I did for the, the art itself. But yeah. Um, and I got to record with Matoti, who I'll nice. give you a, a memento of after we finish up. But um, when it comes to comics, though, and, and the, the stuff you talked about writing, the notion of we've already talked about the collaborative aspect, but the notion of writing for other people's characters mm -hmm. as opposed to creating your own, even though now that I think about it, both of your novels are They're based on real people. Yeah. yeah. Is that a thing for you in terms of, uh, of A, the writing for other people's characters uh, mm -hmm. and B, you know, working off historical figures. Oh, uh, I haven't really thought about that so much. I mean, having, having historical characters is a good anchor because, uh, you can just rely on some non-negotiable traits. Yeah. You've got parameters. Yeah. Sort of um, writing other people's characters is a little different because if there's living people, you have to actually make adjustments based on what their, you know, their feelings are about them. I mean, I, uh, you know, I did the thrilling adventure hour. That was fantastic because the way that had worked was that I went to a show, was sitting in the audience, and I got to hear Paul F. Tompkins and uh, and Patrick Brewster do their their gig. And when they spoke, I didn't. I, it wasn't this that I got their characters. I got their intonations too. It's really obvious how to write for them. Um, but then also. They're the creations of Ben Acker and Ben Blacker. So I had, that was who I was trying to, you know, please with them. And so collaborating with, uh, with the Bens was actually really interesting because they had all kinds of their own ways of, of, of doing it and releasing of information. And of course they came out with these great episodes that was a real collaboration. Cause I mean, some of it was just me hearing voices, but it wasn't the same voices that they heard. And of course they know how to write for live theater in a way I don't. And so yeah. A lot of times my jokes would come out backwards because I'd be writing for the end of a sentence and they would be writing for beat, wait for the audience to build, wait to build, wait to build. And that, you know, kind of like they understood how laughter works and right. things like that in a way that I would not know from just being on the page. And so it was a lot of interesting, different sort of rewriting and, and back and forth that I would not have anticipated. It was really educational. Mm -hmm. And did it stick with your, your script basically, or did they kind of, Oh no, I mean, so uh, off wildly. It, both. Okay. I mean, it was drafting and drafting. And so like Ben would get back. Um, I worked with Ben Acker on most of them specifically closely. And, uh, he, he it would either be, I would do something, he would do something to it. I would do something, then he would do something to it. Or it would come back and be completely stuff that he had done, and then I would make a comment on it or end up being this the stuff I had. It's all over the place. It's like, don't worry, we'll keep listing you as a writer. It's okay. You know? <laughs> I mean, and then with uh, um, with Night Vale, uh, it was, I think with the first one, I feel like uh, what I did with them is I turned it in and then like, I feel like like the next day I turned on the podcast and there it was. I mean, I know it wasn't exactly like that, but <laughs> it was pretty close. Yeah. 
Well, this yeah. will be airing tomorrow. So. Nice. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I did it last week. But, yeah. uh, and you tried writing for Nick Fury. Now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it's a wonderful anecdote, which, yeah. again, is one that, that – um, Mirrors my experience. I never went to the level of actually sending something to Marvel. I never did. Huh? Um, because I didn't know how one does that. And yeah, I didn't let that stop me. Yeah, see, yeah. and that, I did let those things stop me. And that's yeah. why I'm just a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> <laughs> but you got the, the great anecdote about getting a, a letter back for, or correspondence with Jim Shooter. Yeah. Who did the same thing a generation earlier, basically. Yeah. Maybe um, a bit earlier when he was... 12 or 14 years yeah, old yeah, um, yeah. writing comics. Supporting whatever. his family, writing in Pittsburgh. and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you wish you'd stuck with comics? No. Okay. No, it's. I thought about that a little bit just because um, it was such a, you know, such a intense love I had of it. Yeah. But I don't think my ideas were great comic ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I had a, a couple of them here and there and I might have been able to develop that sort of universe. But for me... Uh, I like narrative. I mean, I like the way that comics made me feel, but I don't think I came up then in, in with really ideas to extend that that well. They were okay. Um, but you know, he shooter's advice to like go and learn about fiction was good advice. Um, and I did get a, a deeper, uh, when I stopped reading comics and started reading, let's see, like John Irving and Robertson Davies and uh, Vance Beaujolais, now playing at Canterbury, which like no one else seems to have read. I have no idea what that is. That's, yeah. I'm going to look that up now. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like this mid-70s novel that was very highly thought of at the time. I remember like I just got an excerpt in Esquire or something like that. And it's a retelling of the Canterbury Tales at a during the summer session of a college that's putting on an opera and uh it was beyond me you know i was way too young to be reading it but it's like oh it's like oh it's it's sort of like when i was a little kid it's like five or six and i woke up because i heard the tv on in the middle of the night and my dad was watching an old marx brothers movie and i thought oh this is what adults do in the middle of the night they watch old marx brothers movies like <laughs> this is so how i felt when i was reading now playing at canterbury it's like i don't understand this fiction but this is what adults read you know it was you know i'm sure all kinds of like academic hijinks that i wouldn't recognize until i was a graduate student years later yeah yeah Oh, wow, lucky Jim. This is yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have that on the shelf too. Yeah, is there a author or book you you try to champion that you you oh heck yeah. always just try to force on people to to yeah look at a copy of the Zweig novella? But yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, where to start? I mean, I've got I've I've got so many that are obscure and that I get very excited about. There's well, there's two of them. Um, uh, Futility by William Gerhardy. Uh, it's this strange, uh, hybrid of Chekhov and Waugh. Uh, he grew up in Russia, Brit, and he left during the revolution and landed in England and sort of the aristocracy. And so he got both senses of humor yeah. and it's just a book about the American and it's about the, it's about the allied intervention in Russia, uh, in 1918 and about how that affects this aristocratic family. And it's this laugh out loud funny sort of take on people from the outside trying to help the russians help themselves and how badly that goes it's it's great the other one is uh, every man dies alone by hans falada uh one of the best books i have ever read of fiction uh it already was but now it takes on an essential new kind of depth which is uh he wrote it he wrote this in 1946 in something like three weeks, but it's crazy. He wrote it in like this, this haze. Um, it's a thriller set in 1942, say, in Berlin. Uh, this middle-aged couple takes a stand against Hitler, which is what that actually means. What that translates out to is pathetic and small and yet terrifying. Mm -hmm. And it's about their boarding house, like how it reacts to this thing happening that's anti-Hitler in the middle of Berlin in 1942 and how badly it goes for everybody. And what's interesting about it, it's got this Dickensian top to bottom of society representation, except it's a society in the middle of fascism. 
And so you see all the different levels of moral grayness with everybody all the way from the outright snitches to the people who are just trying to get along, the people who are actually trying to do the right thing, how they're all taken down by this system. And, uh, you know, at the time it was just depressing to read, um, but exciting. It was really, it's a page turner. It's like, uh, it's got a level of threat and, and suspense to it. That's up there with a lot of Stephen King. And of course now, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't see any parallels. whatsoever. Yeah, to what you're yeah. It does make me think I need to send you a copy of, of cultural amnesia, the, the big Clive James essay collection. I'd be very also. curious about that. I don't know much about it. It's, so, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll explain it to you off mic mm-hmm. cause it kind of fits everything you're talking about. Yeah. Um, the feeling the first time you saw Carter beats a devil, not on a bookshelf, but in a reader's hands <laughs> or like on an airplane. Uh, well, so there's a background to that. Uh, the first time I ever published anything, it was in 1994. There was a local newspaper called the East Bay Express, sort of the, uh, it's equivalent of the LA weekly or something like that. And, uh, I'd written a 10,000 word uh, essay about my experience on suicide prevention when I used to work the phones there. And uh, I'd worked on it for months and months and months to get it into shape. And it was my first thing out there. And so I, free weekly, a lot of cafes, I hung out in every fucking cafe in Berkeley waiting to see somebody (laughs) read a story. And let's say it come out came out on like Thursday morning, <laughs> every day being in a cafe. <laughs> Finally, like the next Tuesday, I see this woman reading my story and I was like stalking her. And I came up and I said, so are you enjoying that essay? She said, yes, I am. I said, well, I wrote it. And she said, I'm hoping this essay explains to me why my son killed himself. <laughs> Just start walking out of the cafe. <laughs> So what that informed for me was the idea of, oh, it's their experience. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I a few times have seen people reading Carter in the Wild. I've never, ever, ever approached them. Oh, I I wasn't asking approach, but your feelings, because again, you managed to avoid your feelings. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, great. I mean, it's, it's humbling. It's amazing. I mean, every time, and it's happened a few times, someone tells me Carter's their favorite book. I'm, I'm just blown away. It's, you know, it was, I, I used to write in this basement. It was this concrete lined basement. It leaked in the winter and I, you know, had floppy disks and stuff, you know, it was like, it was, I had no idea this and I'd written four books beforehand and this could have been the fifth fucking learning experience in a row. And I was going to try to be okay with that. I kept thinking this was better than the other ones, but I wasn't sure. And so it just was like, okay, is it just for me? It's just yeah, what, for me. What was that difference? Uh, oh. I guess you're, you're getting to, but yeah. How did, how did, how, what made this publishable when the first four were a oh. disaster? Uh, you see it on fiction writing program, Mm hundred percent. I think, I mean, uh, as I'm recalling it now, uh, I was in a room with 12 other really good writers, uh, and then, you know, rotating teachers in and out who really cared about it, who were very good critics, who I had this permission for two years to just make the book better. And again, it was about listening to their reactions. It was probably similar to doing the open mic, except for in this case, it was, Turning in 20 pages, hearing how people reacted to it, and then trying to improve it for them. Uh, that was one of the reasons it was good. The other reason it was probably good was that I had decided to do a voice in it that was unlike my own. I was doing a nonfiction voice. So uh, that gave it an error that I would not have come across easily if I was trying to just do it as fiction. Um, and I was older... I was a little bit more in tune with my emotional side. Mm -hmm. Those were all, it was time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that workshop process would have salvaged the earlier books or okay. That's, that's, that was sort of the, you know, no, no, there's there's something special about this too. Well, yeah. I mean, this, I, I, I did workshop the beginning of uh, one of the books once and it just felt good. Good. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Some things are not meant to be published. I've learned that (laughs) the course of my life. Pretty extensively. Uh, just kidding. Um, 
Oh my God, I think we actually tackled, I have a 9-11 joke, but we really can't go with that. Fair. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Although I should actually point out. It was tremendously inconvenient for me, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Well, yeah. your your pub date for the hardcover for Carter was 9-11. Yeah. I actually want to offer you some solace. You know, Jack Welch, the former head of GE? Yeah. He had a book that was going to change the face of management mm -hmm. and business through Lean Six Sigma and all of these great yeah. operational processes. It, too, was published on yeah. September 11th, 2001. Yeah. And lo and behold, no one was that interested at that point in, in you know, yeah. Yeah. hearing how we're going to realign our businesses and our, our you know, springboards to excellence and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So, so I know it was inconvenient for you, but... It was much, much worse for someone who, you know, was expecting much bigger yeah. things. Yeah, I, I felt, I mean, you know, one of the things for me was that it was just, it's, it was just a book coming out. The, the biggest thing was this, my publisher had, if you see any New York Times for 9-11, which no one does, it's 9-12, people look at, you know, the next yeah. one, but the 9-11, completely filled with color ads for Carter Beats the Devil. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was their big thing was they actually took out color ads for, for, for the book then. Uh, but, you know, I... Uh, I feel worse for a friend of mine who had a, uh, he actually, uh, there was a, it was 2020. It's one of the big dateline, whatever, whatever the big things were. That was Monday night. Yeah. He was featured on it. He had a, uh, a pitch he'd done for them. They interviewed him and he had, his agent was ready to go next morning out to all the editors in New York with this pitch based on the 2020 thing. Mm -hmm. Great story, but of course, you know, yeah. Uh, Twitter last year, there was a guy talking about the great interview he had just done with Charlie Rose. Oh, uh, one day before everything cracked, that was well. I guess that's never going to air. So yeah, <laughs> I'll get another chance at, at this. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's certain things we can't control. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the last question you, you mentioned having this giant list broken out by you yeah. know, your various categories for for next projects. Any thoughts? On what, oh, what I'm going to do next. Yeah, what you're actually planning. Um, well, being down in L.A., I'm looking to do some writing on the land of TV and stuff. Um, and then I've got an idea for another piece of historical fiction I'd like to do. Uh, and um, what else? Uh, I would I have I, I would really like to somehow do something involving uh, more Jack Kirby stuff for the mainstream world. I don't really know what that is. I was sort exactly. of wondering if you had a, a prose novel, not quite Cavalier and Clay. Um, it wouldn't be a novel. I don't know what it would be, but I am always interested when people who don't know anything about Kirby find out about him. There's, it's the, the depths of his experience in the 20th century and how he used them to make art. I feel like that's something that hasn't really been explored. You know, you, uh, I, I, uh, the Schultz biography that got a lot of, um, a lot of press and got slammed in a lot of ways for, uh, how Schultz was characterized. There's a, there's a passing anecdote in there about how Schultz might have been part of the, uh, crew that liberated Dachau. It seems pretty likely. It seems like his unit was involved in mm -hmm. that. And, when you hear that and you start thinking about peanuts, it's like a lot of it makes, it's like you could see yeah. Yeah. all that somehow. And I feel like there's some sort of uh, relationship between Kirby's war experiences and the massive appeal of Marvel movies that it is uh, not entirely been explored. I don't really understand it yet, but yeah, something probably to be written there. Understood. You a Marvel movie fan in particular, or do you wait for video? I go back and forth depending on the film. Yeah. You know, saw Infinity War in the theaters. Haven't seen Ant Man and the Wasp yet. Uh, 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 still need to catch up on some of the TV. You know, I, I love the show Jessica Jones. Yeah, uh, it, it speaks to me. Oh, that's the other episode three hundred idea, Dave Sim. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, that's, that's, that's why it was funny. Cause, yeah, yeah, right. Because yeah. of everything. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Glenn, I'll let you get back to it. Thanks so much for coming on the show. An absolute pleasure. And that was Glenn David Gold. His new memoir, I Will Be Complete, was published by Knopf this summer, and you can find it in good bookstores everywhere. 
His first novel, Carter Beats the Devil, is one of my all-time faves, and his second, Sunnyside, is highly recommended by the guy who connected me and Glenn, Howard Chaikin. Uh, I'll read it this fall, let you know what I think. And as I think I made clear at the top, I loved I Will Be Complete, and I think you'll dig it too. You don't need to have read his previous books to appreciate this one. It's a fantastic story, very well written. Now, Glenn's website is Glenn David Gold. Glenn only has one N, so that's G-L-E-N-D-A-V-I-D-G-O-L-D dot com. That's got links to his books and some of his reviews and interviews, and presumably this podcast when it goes up. He's on Twitter as Glenn David Gold, spelled just like the website, no dashes or underscores. And after we wrapped, I asked Glenn, so, who you're reading? That took us down some interesting terrain, so if you want to hear his answer to that and the conversation that ensued, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show and get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode features book recommendations from last quarter's Virtual Memory Show guests, including Stephen Heller, Dean Haspiel, Jaime Hernandez, J.J. Settlemeyer, Michael Kupperman, Ilana Meyer, Christopher Brown, Irvin Ungar, Alberto Manguel, Chris Reynolds, and Dave Calver. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project that I've let fall to the wayside yet again, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at Glenn's home in Los Angeles. It was part of my 30-hour visit to L.A. prior to a conference in San Diego, as I mentioned at the top. So my company paid for my airfare and my parking back in New Jersey, uh, but I paid for my hotel in L.A. Uh, and my rental car and meals for that part of the trip. All told, about $400 or so in total for, well, for three podcasts that I got out of the visit. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a uh, Moby. That's right, Moby, the electronic musician who was also part of those 30 hours in L.A. Until then, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, TuneIn, and Spotify by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way.